welcome to the second episode of the Creative Wanderer podcast. I'm Jo and I am joined as I will be every week on this journey by the lovely Amelia. Hello Amelia. Hi Jo. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. Amelia, hmm. are you packed and ready to get on this journey? Definitely. I'm packed and ready to go. Ready to go indeed. Hurrah. This is the first week of our creative journey as part of the Artist Way. It is exciting because we are looking at recovering a sense of safety. When it comes to our creativity, that feeling of safety, that we are safe to express ourselves, is crucial in our artistic journey and development. It most certainly is. And if you are ready to embark on the journey, and if you have begun the artist's way, as we hope you have, and you want an extra member of your sacred circle, we are very, very happy to be able to offer you our support in a number of ways. You can email us and let us know what you are enjoying or indeed what you are struggling with at creative underscore wanderer at yahoo.com. And please follow us on Instagram share some pictures with us and they can be your pictures that you feel inspired by quotes you've been inspired by or affirmations which resonate with you we'd love to see them we had to get very creative when it came to getting a handle for instagram Absolutely. it was really tough we finally settled upon at creative wanderer but we've had to substitute part of creative with the number eight and the beginning of wanderer with the number one if you like myself find yourself struggling in the beginning to make time Time for your morning pages. What helped me on my journey was Jo and the fact that I knew that I could always check in with her and let her know, oh Jo, I've done my morning pages. Oh, I've done my artist date. Show off. <laughs> <laughs> you can use our email to drop us a quick note, a message saying, oh, by the way, I've done my morning pages. I've done my artist date. If you reach a milestone, such as a full week of writing your morning pages or two weeks or a month, three months, six months, let us know. We'll give you a shout out. We'll mention you and your creativity. We will indeed. And I think it's really important for us to point out a little caveat. Oh yes, we just like to say that we are in no way, shape or form affiliated with Julia Cameron. Joe and I are just two creatives, two gals that got together and worked through the book, had incredible experiences. It changed our lives and realised, let's talk about it, let's podcast about it and let others know about our experience. Yes, the question is... How did you find this week, Amelia? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was incredible. When you read through the chapter, you're reminded of your long buried dreams. You're reminded about those times when you wanted to express yourself creatively, but your impulses and your communication was squashed. And it was squashed often, in the first instance, by parents. So when we start recovering those instances and just allowing ourselves to express those long buried dreams... We find a sense of safety, a sense of liberation. And I remember calling you up going, but I feel so free, I feel so creative. And so many of my projects that I had buried and forgotten about, I resurrected them. That's just lovely, isn't it? Yeah, I experienced a huge sense of liberation. I felt like a bird that was let out of a cage. Synchronicity has been phenomenal. But in all parts of my life the universe we live in it's such a creative universe and once you give yourself the permission to actually articulate your artistic impulses desires and you feel safe you know you're in a safe environment the creative universe recognizes you as a co-creator and goes "Ooh, you on the same page as me let's flow let me throw some synchronicity your way let me help you on that journey i'm so happy that you woke up to your creativity and let's flow together and create together there's one basic principle that says when you're creating there's more creativity creativity breeds creativity absolutely as you step into week one you encounter something called the, the shadow artist <laughs> I think we've all actually ticked that box and have lived in that category for a number of years, months, days. A whole life. <laughs> shadow artist, Joe. what is it all about? Your shadow artist is that little scamp. It's your naysayer. It's ignoring your artistic talents, your traits, telling you no, 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 no. Oh, you could do that if you wanted to, but get a proper job. And you can do this thing that literally makes your heart sing as a hobby. Do it on the side. Yes. But make sure you can pay the bills. It just wants you to be sensible. It's happy for you to help other people, 
be creative. Mm-hmm. Happy to help them in their creative endeavours, but if it's not going to pay your bills, don't do it. It's so true. What I loved about this chapter and then the tasks connected to it is that it does take you back to your childhood. And again, we're talking about the sense of safety. As children, we are encouraged to paint and draw and sing and dance. And then all of a sudden, this imaginary line gets drawn at the age of about 13, 14. Mm. When you step into secondary school, now we have to think about what you're going to be when you grow up. <gasps> I hate that so much. Parents and our teachers want to prepare you for the fact that this is a tough universe and you need to become a bit more sensible. The problem is, if you are a creative being, an artist, as a child perhaps your parents were encouraging your creativity and you felt safe. But now as you're growing up, you start hearing very few artists are successful. How are you going to live? All of a sudden, we are faced with suppressing those artistic urges. And we start feeling, if I express myself as an artist, perhaps people will criticise me, tell me to stop daydreaming, to get serious. We start communicating as artists and creatives less and less and less. And we cross into that shadow land of dreams and hopes and wishes. And actually, the worst part, we stop creating. We become shadow artists. We hope to be an artist or a creative one day. You're a singer, a poet, a writer, an actor, a sports person, a painter. But you know what? Let's not talk about my dreams. I'll just quietly sit in the corner and observe other artists who are successful. And hopefully one day success is just magically going to happen for me. It really is that, isn't it? As a teenager, I acted and I was really passionate about acting. I was congratulated on how wonderful I was. I was accepted to study drama Mm. at college and my dad said, I don't think you should. There are so many great actors out there. And what if you're just not one of them? And I was devastated. Julia put the chapter together as well as the tasks connected to it where you actually have an opportunity to excavate and go back to your childhood and remember all those moments when you squashed your artistic or creative impulses. Our parents... Friends, grandparents, teachers, of course they want the best for us. I always like to remember that. The recovery is not constructed in such a way that you just go back and start saying, it's my parents' fault. No, No, it is what it is. At the end of the day, you were caught up in that situation. Acknowledge the source of the artistic creative suppression Mm -hmm. and then recover that flame of creativity definitely this chapter was all about negotiating the world we are living in which is so structured money driven time driven success driven achievement driven and then looking at yourself saying actually I'm not that type of a person I don't necessarily like all that structure I'd like to be left alone I just want to be enveloped immersed in my own world of creativity and then I want to present to the world what I've created. Yes. This takes us to the left right brain attributes. We've got our notes up and she's got a beautiful diagram of the left brain and right brain attributes. But you and I are very different. Mm. I think we like to believe we're both very much right brain creatives, but you're more analytical than I am. And I am, I think I'd use the term airy fairy. (laughs) (laughs) I actually have done a test to test my left right balance. I think I'm quite balanced, which is a bit unusual. Mm. We all know that the artistic brain is the right brain. Yep. It's the brain that loves to live in the dreamland, loves imagery and feelings, symbols, colours, rhythm. It's creative, spontaneous, imaginative. It loves to live in the fantasy land and daydream. This is where the early conflict in our upbringing might happen, is that the environment just doesn't really get you. I was called strange by my mum. Right. Thank goodness for that. (laughs) I would much rather be strange than quote-unquote normal. I'd rather be the dreamer. Because society dictates that there's only a certain amount of creativity available. Those of us who are more right brain and live in the dream, live in the colour, the symbols, live in all of that joy and play, we're told, well, no, only some people can do it. Only the very successful people can do it. Only people who have money can do it. Mm -hmm. So then you are dragged back into having to use your left brain. So that feeling of this expansion that we experience Mm -hmm. as creatives when we are in the flow, and then you step out into the real world, 
It's such a shock sometimes for me. So I'm still learning how to reconcile the practicality that's required to live in this physical universe Mm -hmm. and balancing it with this incessant urge to constantly live in my world. I really feel that I've created not only my own universe, I have an Amelia Ellen planet that I live on. (laughs) Planet Amelia. Planet Amelia. Beautiful place, I'm sure. I find that fascinating because you were talking there about being in flow when you're creating. When I'm painting, time just stops. Mm -hmm. There is no time. I am in no time whatsoever. I am just in absolute flow, connected to my higher self, connected to the universe. Creativity is just flowing through me and I'm there slapping paint onto a canvas and it is transformative. I absolutely adore dance. Mm. In fact, I've learned more about the craft of acting through dancing. Oh, wow. Whenever I was creatively blocked as an actor, I would actually get up and start dancing because in dance, especially ballet, you cannot not be present. Yeah. You really have to disengage from your analytical brain that's constantly criticizing you. You have to let it go. And when you watch really masterful artists, creatives who merge with their art, they become that. They become the painting. They become the music. They become the instrument. Yeah. I've learned more about my artistic expression by observation of other people being creative. I was just thinking, there's a lovely phrase, a good workman never blames his tools. Ah, I love that. That really does fit with when you're in flow and you are using the tool of choice, whether it be your voice, an instrument, your paints, whatever it is that you're using, you cannot blame that which you are working with because it is an extension of you in that moment. It is such an interesting subject, this whole idea of suppression of our artistic impulses and how to uncover them the left right brain attributes now if you're curious about your left right brain attributes in our blog on medium we have put in a link which you can click on that tells you how to find out which side of your brain is more dominant well i've not done that well not recently i think i did a a very long time ago and that's what told me i was a creative airy fairy person i might do it again and see what happens we have our shadow artist and we want to get rid of it Well, you know what? (laughs) I always think you don't want to get rid of all this stuff because it might come in handy. It might come in handy. You're absolutely right. But you do want to expose it to light and say it's okay to be an artist and protect your artist child within from the harsh criticism of your shadow artist and the myriad shadow artists who are attracted to your talent come and attach themselves to you because they see you as a potential vehicle for them Mm. to Go on this journey with you, with you being the propeller, the engine, if you will, to help them get up the hill. And they're just tagging on. It's interesting that you speak to that because, yes, you're right. The other side of the medal when it comes to the shadow artist is the complete opposite. Is If you shine so bright, i.e. you've actually exposed your shadow artist to the light, you might start feeling that you want to drag yourself back into the shadows. Yes. Which brings me to another point. There are people in our lives who would have suppressed our artistic impulses, but... Nothing or nobody is more powerful than yourself. And you actually putting down yourself and telling yourself, I'm not good enough and believing all that internal monologue. One of your favourite things, Amelia, is that recovery is a gentle process. You are the gentle gardener of your garden of creativity. It takes time to nurture talent, to nurture any type of growth. And we've got to be gentle. A gardener does not walk into his or her garden and start shouting at the plants. Grow! Because they're not growing (laughs) fast enough. Or if they're not bearing enough fruit to give me more. It doesn't work like that. It's planting those seeds and just trusting God, universe, the great creator, spirit, life force will take care of the growth. We do love a pearl of wisdom from Julia. And she says it takes nurturing to make an artist. In order to recover an artist, you must be willing to be a bad artist. Mm. Give yourself permission to be a beginner. So true, isn't it? Just remember that it's okay to mess up. It's all right to start something. It goes through a process of being the ugly duckling. When I start a painting, I go, oh, that's nice. I like that. And I think, oh, no, no, no. I need to add something more to it. And I add more layers. And I go, oh, no, I shouldn't have done that. What will happen is it'll be what it's going to be because it has to be that. Mm -hmm. you can't expect to be perfect 
the first time you do it. Oh, absolutely. That stage of one's creative exploration when we're just beginning to learn is booby-trapped with failure. And this is where shadow artists are born. Mm -hmm. Because you start, let's say, writing poetry or writing books or painting or dancing or acting. And our ego likes to compare us to the great masters. Oh, yeah. So Joe's just started painting and all of a sudden she thinks, well, I'm not as good as Picasso. Picasso would have spent decades and decades honing Mm. that art. He's already at the mastery level of skill. We are just beginning. Mm. You will fall. It'll be messy. It'll look ugly. It'll sound ugly. Leave it. You are learning. You're growing. We mustn't compare ourselves to mastery level of skill when we are starting off. We have to allow ourselves to be quote unquote bad. I mean, it's not even bad. We're growing. And remember, you mustn't compare yourself to anybody else Mm. because nobody is you. This is what I love about Jo and her painting. Jo spontaneously grew into this incredible painter. That's very kind. It's true. It was amazing to watch your talent just emerge and it arrived like a gift. Jo is not judging it. Jo just says, oh, to damn painting. And then a couple of hours later, she'd send me, oh, this is what I've done. And I'm like, this incredible painting just emerged out of Jo. So you're not criticizing yourself. You're just allowing it yeah. to come out the way it is without that sensor. So thank you for that. I've learned a lot from just watching you paint and watching your artistic expression develop. Thank you very much. So, Amelia, shall we take a moment, take in the scenery and reflect? Well, you know what that means. It's the time to ring my lovely feng shui bell. So what are we reflecting on this week? We are reflecting on how we have been spoken to throughout our lives, how we speak to ourselves, how we allow ourselves to be spoken to, and how do we make sense of it and come into our own and feel good about ourselves, not just ourselves as creative artists or creative beings, but just ourselves on a day-to-day basis. We often hear, she loves herself. If you're being kind to yourself and you're allowing yourself to accept praise or you're giving yourself praise, we've spoken in the past, how difficult you found that to give Mm -hmm. yourself praise. Well, this chapter meant a lot to me in terms of looking at my self-worth. I'm a type of person that's very often just focused on the other people and giving to others Mm -hmm. rather than actually filling up my own well and giving to myself. I had to actually look at how am I speaking to myself in terms of my self-worth? Is it high? Is it low? I discovered I had some issues with that that I had to work through (laughs) and give myself permission to nurture myself, to love myself, to be kind to myself and to draw certain boundaries and say enough is enough. You do not have to rescue the world. We've decided this week to look at a lovely word which ties into self-worth and how we speak to ourselves unkindly. The word is disparagement and the dictionary definition. Regard or represent as being of little worth. Mm. The other term is bring discredit on. To discredit somebody. They're not worthy or they're not good enough to be doing what they're doing. To take the credit away Mm. from yourself. Comes from Latin, par equals, so below par. Yes, There is so much power in that word. Mm. Do not disparage yourself. Do not discredit who you are. So we would like you to think about how do you speak to yourself? Do you speak to yourself as you would your best friend? Or do you tear strips off yourself in admonishment? This is a lesson that I learned relatively recently. Your self-talk is often really cruel. The very best friend one can have is oneself. So why on earth would you be saying such awful things to yourself? Think about that. Think about your upbringing. What were your family values regarding Mm -hmm. self-esteem? I grew up in a culture. If you perhaps were too proud of yourself, you would never openly praise yourself because it was looked upon as boasting. Self-worth became a one-way street. It was what was given to me. I was always on a receiving end. I never realized, hang on a minute. I can be kind to myself. I can praise my work. We've got to start listening for any of that talk that we do on a daily basis, which actually doesn't do us any good. If it doesn't serve you, don't say it. How do you react to compliments? Do they make you cringe? Do you go, oh, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, and you make yourself small? Oh, isn't that mad, though, I that know. we do that? can't appear as though you're loving 
it. You have to go, no, 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 it's just, it, never mind. <laughs> no, we are all lovely. Let's just love each other. Just say, do you know what? I am really good at this. Thank you so much. Give yourself a little tap on the shoulder and say, I'm absolutely marvellous. I'm fabulous. I'm so good at life and living. That's something that we need to start practising more and more as artists. Definitely. So this area of self-observation, introspection, takes us even deeper into finding out where does that negative disparaging self-talk come from? Well, it comes from the enemy within. They're the core negative beliefs and they make you scared. They keep you small. They're always trying to tell you you're not good enough. You're not going to achieve it. They are the major disparagers. Oh, yes, they They're are. They're beasts. Many a beast will be encountered <laughs> and dealt with on the artist's way journey. Trust me, many an ogre. And, you know, some of them, although they're ogres, will be quite friendly mm -hmm. because after confronting them, they do become your friends. They do. So it's good to distinguish that we have beliefs yeah. and we've got positive beliefs, yes. i.e. the beliefs that serve us. Yes. And then we have negative beliefs, the beliefs that do not serve us. Some of them are really, really fundamental, yeah. deeply rooted inside oh of God, us. Yes. We accept them, adopt them, or they can be literally hammered into us through our upbringing. They're determined either by the society you live in, your family values, even groups of friends that you belong Mm -hmm. to can influence your beliefs. This is a little definition that we came across while we were doing our mm -hmm. creative wanderings into core negative beliefs. <laughs> it says core beliefs are a person's most central ideas about themselves, others and the world. These beliefs act like a lens through which every situation and life experience is seen. Because of this, people with different core beliefs might be in the same situation but think, feel and behave very differently. Even if a core belief is inaccurate, it still shapes how a person sees the world. Harmful core Core beliefs lead to negative thoughts, feelings and behaviours, whereas rational core beliefs lead to balanced reactions. It's a very good definition because sometimes not only have they been drummed into us, but because they've been drummed into us, we end up serving them. Mm. So we end up serving the negative rather than the positive, which can have such a devastating effect. Oh, it can. There is nothing wrong with beliefs. We've got to examine them. If you do find yourself having strong beliefs or reactions to the question or to your own examination of, am I an artist? Am I creative? Is my creation and creativity and this creative product that I put out, is it worth any? You can start with that and you can listen to very strong visceral reactions to those thoughts and start pinpointing the beliefs you have about that. And then you ask yourself, well, where do they come from? Are they mine? Is it something that the society considers to be true? Lots of excavation and digging mm -hmm. in that chapter for me. What you're told as a child, you do tend to sort of hang your coat on. There is also an element of wanting to fit within a yes, certain group or society. Absolutely. If you've got core negative beliefs as well as the core positive beliefs, mm -hmm. they're incredible. They link to each other and they love to expand and grow. So what we're looking at is perhaps shrinking the area of negativity and expanding the area of positivity. Mm. I will touch upon just one core negative belief that I had to deal with. I'm sure you resonate with this one. If you are creative in one particular area, such as painting or acting that's it mm -hmm. you cannot be multi-talented or a multidisciplinary you just can't be doing too many no don't do things. too many things because you become a jack of all trades which i hate as a term jack of all trades master of none Ooh, that really really gets under my skin because i do lots of different things you do lots of different yes. things because the creative well is so huge it's infinite. It is really just not sitting anymore on that artistic impulse and viewing creativity in a very broad sense of definition. But also to remember as well, if a creative idea wants to get out, it will find a way out. Let's not forget, you've got your ally within. Yay! First, we remove the gunk. We allow ourselves to be who we are in a safe environment. This mm -hmm. podcast, we hope, is a safe environment for you to be a creative we need to look at turning all that chitter chatter, negative chitter chatter in your head into the most affirming positive beliefs. Yes, we do. The definition of affirmations is something declared to be true. So it is already true. A positive statement or judgment. It comes from Middle English affirmen, from Old French affirme, from Latin affirmar. It means to strengthen. You're going to strengthen these beliefs you have of yourself. It reinforces all of the positivity. The more you say, the more you feel them, the more you think them. I think this links into the magic of I am and the magic of be, do, have. Oh, yes. Try writing it down or even more interesting, 
Try looking in the mirror and saying it to yourself. This line, I am a brilliant and prolific whatever you are. See how you react to it. See if you're even having trouble writing it down, yet alone saying it Mm -hmm. because you think, oh, I'm not. Because the sensor will go, well, you're not. Where's the proof? Mm. And then you remind yourself, hang on a minute. The rule is be, do, have. First, you've got to be. You are by declaring and affirming, I am X, Y, Z. Then you do as X, Y, Z. Then you have as X, Y, Z. What are some of your favourite My affirmations. affirmations. So the first one I write every day. I am focused on my divine life's purpose. These are ones I wrote out of turning the sensor upside down and turning the blurt inside out. I also say another one, which is I create from my heart. Oh, that's gorgeous. You did mention one thing, blurts. It's the blurts that actually point to your negative beliefs and those are the ones you rewrite. They are indeed. Tell me some of yours. I I had a bit of a problem with my affirmations because that ties into my uh, challenge with self-worth, but Mm -hmm. I got there in the end. Yay! I have... My creativity is welcomed and accepted with open arms and open hearts. Oh. And my creativity is in constant and abundant demand. That's lovely. Yeah. As I travelled through week one, Joe, I really realised how masterful Julia is at understanding what needs to be recovered and how to approach that very sensitive area. I am personally so grateful for that. I've had lots of healing in this chapter. That's marvellous. It's worth remembering that the limiting beliefs give us the opportunity of recovery, but it's the affirmations that create that space of safety. Do not brush over them. In fact, make them very important. At the end of your morning pages, listen out for the blurts, recognize them as core negative beliefs or negative beliefs, rewrite them as affirmations. There's a lot of tasks the first week, but they do help you really move through because you're clearing out, essentially. You're recognizing your naysayers. I know you absolutely loved the tasks this week. I really enjoyed writing letters of forgiveness to oneself and to others. And when I was looking at those to forgive, it takes us back to a point about people who are shadow artists themselves telling you that you're not good or you shouldn't do something. I had to really work on that. So I wrote a letter to them, Mm. but I forgave them for it because they are themselves blocked. We've all been there. There's no finger pointing at anyone. No, not at all. Checking in is vital at the end of every week. Yes. We were giddy actually on our first check-in. And in fact, I think we probably talked for nearly three hours but it's really important and if you don't have somebody else to talk to it's to check in with yourself have I written my morning pages this week Mm. have I taken myself out on an artist date yes was there any synchronicity in my week why ahead of me I can see a neon light it says the inspiration station toot toot there you go this is a little section to talk about our creative wanderings where this chapter took us to it was my artist date Mm. this week it took me to the pond I took with me my sketch pad and I sat in the sunshine and I drew ducks and I had an absolutely lovely time what it did for me was it just gave me the opportunity to be and see what came out of me Mm. because that takes me to my tiny little quote by Robin Norwood This is the most important takeaway. Make your own recovery the first priority of your life. Absolutely. So important. What has inspired you? I looked into Kenning, which is K-E-N-N-I-N-G. A (laughs) Kenning is when you take two words and combine them as a mild translation or metaphor for something else. Ooh. So you will find lots of Kenning in Scandinavian poetry. Right. And you might come across a poem about five brave men aboard a wave floater. What's a wave floater? Would it be a ship, Amelia? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love Kenning because ship can be such a dreary word comparing to a, a wave floater. Yeah. It is filling up your well. Remember, we fill up our creator wells by using imagery. That's what speaks to me about Kenning. Kennings were often used to describe everyday people, animals and objects. So, Joe, I have a little mm. test for you. Oh, good. So what is an ankle biter? A child. Oh, a very young child. A bean counter. An accountant. Ooh, well done. Bookworm. A reader. Mm-hmm. Brown noser. Ooh, um, a sycophant. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. A person who does anything to gain approval. Head twister. A gorgeous, beautiful person. Oh, no, no, no. no. An owl. Oh, an owl is a head twister. <laughs> hot potato. A hot potato is, a hot, is an attractive person. Oh, it's something no one wants. A hot potato. It's a hot potato. Oh, Ooh. there you go. I love this one. 
Motor mouth. Chatterbox. That's us. Yeah. Pigskin. No idea. A football. Oh. Tree swinger. A monkey. A monkey. Tummy slider. A snake. Oh, quite close. A penguin. Oh, marvellous. I guess it could be a snake because we're talking about the Nordic countries. Oh, yes. Okay, a, pe- a penguin is probably a bit closer to uh, <laughs> to what lives up there. So I hope this has <laughs> fun. I offered that. a bit of comic relief to you, but <laughs> it just gives you an idea at how we can uh, use language and imagery to add a bit of colour in our life. Yes, it's fabulous. So listen, we have come to the end of this week. And so coming up next week, Amelia. Week two deals with recovering a sense of identity. We'll be talking about self-acceptance and personal identity and setting boundaries and guarding our creative space and life. It's going to be marvellous. Thank you so much for your time this week, tuning in and listening to Amelia and I ramble on, wander on (laughs) on our creative journey. It's been joyous. So don't forget to tune in next week to hear more. Thank you for wandering with us and remember to always be on the lookout for the presence of wonder. See you next time. Thank you.